Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Stars Daily Sports Podcast. It's Friday, May 7th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. We're talking soccer today with our experts, Ali Trost and Sean Goodwin, starting with the NWSL Legends Field opener earlier in the week. Casey Woso lost the game, but won when it came to environment and setting. When early results didn't go the way of Hugh Williams' NWSL team, he used the rest of the Challenge Cup as something of a preseason, tinkering with lineups and alignments. We talk about that as well. After a break, we switch to Sporting Kansas City and their next game against Austin Football Club on Sunday at Children's Mercy Park. Austin's an expansion team, so you figure a season or two to get their act together, but no. This team brings a 2 and one record to Kansas City, not to mention old friends Matt Beasler and a coaching staff that includes Josh Wolf and Davey Arnault, former Sporting and Wizards players. So, should be a fun homecoming on Sunday. Okay, let's get started talking NWSL and Sporting with Allie and Sean. So we're doing our little chit chat before we start recording, and it's always fun to do that with with Allie and Sean. But to be honest with you, I've been listening to you guys for the past half hour because I just finished listening to the tape of uh, Hugh Williams and Michelle Vasconcelos. Am I pronouncing her last name right? Vasconcelos. Yeah. Spot on. Okay. Although uh, I'm, I'm, I understand from from Hugh Williams, it's Murph to to the. Uh, you know, yeah. to players on the team because that Murphy's are made in name. So, yeah, I have. Um, uh, let's talk about the the media availability for KCNWSL. Um, I, I liked how Hugh Williams framed what's happened over the last few weeks as preseason. I think that's a smart coaching move, kind of a good psychological move too. When your your team didn't advance in the cup, um, and look, there were some. Re, you know, there are certainly reasons to believe that he, you know, he's experimenting with lineups and combinations, that sort of thing, Allie. But uh, I think it's smart to frame it as just it's preseason soccer. Yeah, and especially for a team that underwent so many changes, right? I mean, new city, new coach, you know, different pieces coming into the mix. And, and really, I think the biggest benefit to approaching it that way. And of course, you know, he was very clear that they were still going to be very competitive and and aim to win. But, you know, the biggest thing that hurt them was that they were without so many players on any given week or game um, because of international duty and injury. And so when you are dealing with such a, um, you know, inconsistency, as far as player availability is concerned, you do have to get creative, which on one hand, allowed them to see different player combinations that allowed them to put different players in different positions. And so there was, I think, a lot of knowledge gained from doing that and now will potentially put them in a more advantageous position going into the regular season, having gotten to see um, maybe some players that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten to see if they had approached it in a different way and if they had had uh, more of their veteran type players, you know, some of those international, um, you know, the players who were serving international duty um, who might have more solidified spots in the starting lineup, um, them not being as available, you know, allowed some some younger players or some, you know, more second string type players to get minutes and and to show, you know, the coaching staff what they've got. And now I think the, you know, Hugh and, and his staff have a good idea of, of what this team is made of, where the holes are, strengths, weaknesses, and maybe some positions that they might need to fill as the season goes on. Blair, I, I, I think you put it right in that it was a smart coaching move, smart coaching legs. In that, I mean, I completely agree with you as well, Ali. You know, it, it's a mix between, I think, you know, at the end of the day, this is a team like, yes, they were in Utah, but, you know, new players have came in, different coach, different scenario. We, we've kind of been over all of that. And I think, especially for this kind of early season tournaments, Casey and W. Sat in Louisville as well, who didn't win a single game. Both of those teams kind of get, get a little bit of a pass and calling it a preseason tournament, I guess, just because it is a, you know, it's starting a season. I've I've argued it should be spread over the course of the season. Personally, I think it'll make it a lot better. There's like a break from league play. But you know, um, yeah, you know, as Ali was saying, it's a chance to test players, line ups. If you miss some players, it's a chance for some of the younger, uh, younger girls on the team, younger women, I should say. Um, yes, as, as Hugh Williams uh, <laughs> insisted, you said. Yeah. And Peter Van Meese got in trouble for as well on social media. 
but it, it's hard though because girls is like the equivalent of guys right guys, so yeah. it's like we say guys and it's you know yeah. whatever but i yeah I, the women i, like I, the did, I didn't think it was an issue but people have been getting angry about it so i need to get better about it myself so yeah smart coaching moving like you know we pick up one point else to 12 I mean, after the second game, I think it was, Hugh was calling a preseason tournament. So I kind of think he realised at that point as well that, you know, there's definitely some, some things to fix. And the team has absolutely looked better game by game. Um, I think the low point, honestly, was probably that Chicago first half. That was a, uh, that was tough to watch. It's only been up since there. And I, I think the, the club should be at least disappointed to not been leaving with at least one win. But hey, it's over. Clean slate. And we go again with Louisville. Well, and I won't, um, I'll give him credit for uh, mentioning that he, he thought they underachieved a little bit as well. Like he used the word, uh, thought we underachieved. Yeah. So I look, that's that's being honest and fair too, don't you think? Yeah, no, it yeah. is. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, just looking at the slate of games they had, you know, Portland is always going to be hard, even with the players missing for both teams. Uh, Chicago, good team. But again, you take a late lead, then you, you slip it up in the final couple of minutes. Um, Houston, tough again. And then the most recent game against the Rain. I mean, they were able to be the team. You know, they kind of dropped off a little bit in the second half. But you know, you, you're taking early leads and they could have scored, you know, two, three, four goals. So when you only, uh, you only score one goal and then you only other goal, I guess it was two goals, who was a penalty. And your late goal as well. It's just you have to be disappointed and only taking one point, considering goals that were given by the team and just uh, the situations and scenarios in which it happened. So yeah, I think he's right in saying they can be disappointed, but again, it's a preseason tournament <laughs> if you want to put it that yeah. way. Well, and I think especially that that last game, and maybe it was maybe it was said with a bit of that, you know, most recent game in mind where Amy Rodriguez did have quite a few opportunities uh, to put some some early goals away. And, you know, that'll be I think, you know, that was something Hugh talked about in his press conference was that, you know, they've got to get better to getting out to not just a one goal lead, but, you know, put it home, get a, get a couple more to, to really make it hard for teams to come back. And then, you know, defensively, the back line has has gotten better and more cohesive. And and again, that chemistry, I think, is another thing that as the season wears on, as players are consistently available, um, not just in training, but on game days, it's going to show in the results. Mm-hmm. I thought the Mal Weber goal was a thing of beauty. Um, oh, <laughs> Watched it again last night and I was just like, rewind, press play. It was, it's just, I mean, the way that she's able to just even create a, just a little bit of space for herself with so many OL Reign players around her. Uh, and then the setup from Victoria Pickett was just fantastic. And that's something too, you know, a strength of this team is their quick transition play in the midfield and ability to spark the attack uh, with the speed of Lola Bonta, with the speed of Victoria Pickett and others. And then if you've got a player like Mallory Weber and Amy Rodriguez, of course, you have to throw her in the mix there as well and some of their other uh talented attacking players I mean that goal is a difficult one to score and I mean she made it look way too easy because that was not an easy angle she I mean it was just amazing like I love that goal and I want to have it up on my wall on a loop all the time to watch <laughs> yeah no you you, uh, you summed up Ali you know I feel like I tweeted out at the time she had she had no right to be scoring with that many players around her and I think the impressive thing is too you know when she cut back yeah, it wasn't like she was, you know, striking a ball coming towards her or a ball that has a lot of speed on it. You know, she cut back and, I mean, it was that little space that it was essentially a, almost a dead post. Yeah. Except players on top of that. Uh, so to find that space and, you know, put it right in the top corner, yeah, that was a uh, finger beauty. Put it in the only place, too, she could, right in that, uh, that upper corner. Yep. Um, fantastic goal. Okay. So, hey, I really enjoyed seeing both of you guys out there on on Monday night. And, of course, um, NWSL lost 2-1 to one after after the, the two goals surrendered after the uh, after Mal Weber's goal. Um, I wanted to get your impressions of the setup and the stadium. First game out there, the, the second home opener, right? They played the first one at Children's Mercy, but this is the – uh, this is their. This is going to be their home for good now, and uh, mm-hmm. the Legends Field. Um, Ali, uh, I know you, um, uh, you. You have helped work hard to get, uh, you know, to get things to where they are with this with this organization. 
I, I thought for a first time event, it came off really, really well. Well, and that's just a credit to the countless men and women working hard behind the scenes to get this thing uh, like up and running for that game. I mean, I was there on Saturday before the game and it definitely had a, a ways to go. And I thought that everything came together as perfect as it possibly could um, for that, that first game. And it was just a great atmosphere too. I really did, you know, enjoy the the atmosphere and thought it was really appropriate and just a solid one for, for the team and, and for the fans. And I loved the pitch side seats. I loved that behind those seats, there was a grassy area where kids could run around and play and they got cornhole and um, you know, a, a jungle gym. I mean, it's just like such a family friendly space for, for soccer games to be played and for fans to come out and enjoy and you know I I got a little teary-eyed at the end of the game I heard like a a crowd of young girls on you know I'm sure just a team they went out and watched the game together like even after the game was over they're all leaving and you just hear their faint voices like Casey whoa so and it was just like you know it, it is as much as you know their fan base will range in age and and gender and demographic you know all these different things you know these these women on this team have said time and time again, how important it is to them to inspire that next generation of players. And you did see so many at at both games, so many young, young female soccer players out there and, and looking, you know, to them as idols and, and, Hey, I could do this. And so I I just thought that like the atmosphere was amazing. I know that kind of got away from just like the space itself at legends field, but no, I thought they did a fantastic job. I'm excited to see as, you know, different changes are made and, and things kind of get finished and and ready to go what it looks like. Cause I was really, really impressed. And more and more fans allowed in with the, uh, yes. When you start lifting the restrictions because of COVID, I want to get your thoughts too, Sean, but first I want to add on something that, uh, that Allie said, I, you know, I'm an old sap. I, I got choked up too a little bit. I'll tell you when it was for me. It was after the game, um, after the the team had done their their, their circle meeting at the you know, and uh, both teams are doing doing the meeting. So so the Casey the Casey Woso team breaks up, and um, there's a lot of milling around, right? But I had, I had to look her up because I didn't know who she was. But it was a player, Katie Bowen. Mm-hmm. She went right over to. She went right over to the um, to the stands um, uh, and and was signing autographs and posing for pictures and had the biggest smile on her face for everybody and and it was always it was little girls and parents uh, and she she just could not have been more accommodating and I don't know what I expected I you know I but it just it touched me you know someone who you know has had kids that gone that has gone that have gone through soccer programs and. We've taken him to games over the years, that sort of thing, and um, it was a it was a great moment of connectivity uh, between player and and fans. And I just wanted to recognize her. I just thought she was uh, uh, she, everybody who asked for a photo or an autograph. Uh, she she complied. So a couple other players came over at, with her afterwards, but she was the first one there and was doing it longer and. With a, with a big big smile on her face, so shout out to to Katie Bowen. Yeah, I know that's good to see Blair. Well, back you know back pre COVID, that, that other world we lived in. Um, you know, just even from the early days of the league up until you know COVID kind of happened. Go every team they, they would have these mix zones after you know after games and you know fans and you know from kids up to. 80, 90 year olds, if they were, they were more than welcome to get signatures, take pictures, talk to the players, uh, which is, you know, it's not really something you see with uh, with MLS or, you know, any other really professional sports in this country. So with COVID restrictions, not sure to what extent they're allowed to do that right now, but to see them doing it just with fans, you know, by, you know, in the stands is great to see. So, you know, I I, I did miss that, but I hear what you were saying, Ali, with the uh, Chance and Casey Wo, so it gave me a good laugh. You know, there was like, yeah, the bleachers in the outfield, and then there was some space behind it, and some kids were playing catch with a tennis ball. And I believe the tennis ball went on the field a couple of times during the game. <laughs> I, uh, I heard people complaining about that. So, you know, just typical uh, baseball soccer field combo. Uh, yeah. combo. So, it was, Love uh, it. It was, it was great. You know, fun venue. You could tell there's a, a slight outline of the infields from the Monarchs um, baseball fields, I guess. But that, that was only if you were looking really hard. Otherwise, it, it looked like a, 
a regular soccer field minus the dimensions. So, you know, a great venue. Looking forward to you know, getting that place packed as we get leasing for summer. And of course, the monarchs thing out today that they have full capacity for their opener too. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see when KCNW yourself follows suit. Okay, a couple of other observations from me. I, I just wanted to get them out there. I I did walk around in the second half. I, I walked around the the outside of the uh, the concourse area, right? Just kind of did a lap around the stadium. And one thing I noticed that when you're in the uh, the, the burn section, burn section of the mm-hmm. stadium, so where Woso was attacking in the second half. Um, there, you can't look across the field and see a, a clock. So I, I think they should put a clock on the, maybe on the grandstand or something with a, a little mini scoreboard that uh-huh. tells you the score and the time. You have to kind of look around and crane your neck and look at the, the big scoreboard yeah. if, if you want to keep up. And the other thing, and it's just a, more of a question than, than uh, anything else, Kansas City attacked in the first half toward its larger fan collection right there are more fans in this you know the 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 baseball stand behind the third base dugout and blue crew was yeah yeah and so in the second half they went away from that i don't know if it was because of uh, field conditions or something or but but i just thought that was a little curious that you would you would attack that way in the first half and not the second half i mean it's oftentimes you know clean clean flip whoever wins clean flip chooses what they could attack and kick off and so I'm sure if he has got away, you know, just like Sports and KC would love to attack a cauldron in the second half. Uh, I'm sure KC and WSL would love to attack towards the Blue Crew in the second half. But I'm sure other fan bases now, they know what it's like as well. Obviously, you know, sometimes other things come into it. Might be if there's a song, if there's glare, one team might want to attack the other way till the sun goes down. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I assume most teams, if they want to gain somewhat of an advantage, have the home team attack uh, support the section in the first half. Okay, yeah, I, I think there was probably a reason. Nothing, nothing yeah. was ever done without a reason, right? It's not a random call, but mm-hmm. uh, okay. Hey guys, let's take a break and uh, and switch gears to Sporting Kansas City when we come back. Back with Ali Prost and Sean Goodwin, we're talking soccer. Sporting KC has a game on Sunday against an expansion team that's playing pretty well, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Austin Austin Football Club lost its first game. Since then, they've won two straight. They bring a two and one record to Children's Mercy on on Sunday. You know, we can we can break down the game, but the the headline of this game, of course, is the return of Matt Beasler. And mm-hmm. uh, listen, it's um, uh, I was I don't know how you what you thought about this, guys. Um, it's a business decision, you know, to to um, to release Matt and uh, in pro sports, the, the, these it happens all the time, right? It still was a little bit heartbreaking to see him go, and I kind of wish he'd gone to an Eastern team and not a Western team. Mm-hmm. Because Sporting will play him three times, and and the first time is you know, pretty early in the season. Um, what do you think? What kind of reception is he going to get on uh, on Sunday, Sean? Yeah, I mean, you, you say it's a business decision. Look at Albert Pujols today. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Players age, and uh, you know, the organization decide to move them on eventually. Uh, obviously, you know, it hurts a little bit more for sports in KC, and that Matt Beasley is a Kansas City guy. Uh, but you know, I, I think when he comes back here, then I wrote about it. I did a top 10 things to look forward to for the season, and one of my things was Matt Beasley coming back. Uh, I know, especially in soccer, you don't really at all applaud players from other teams. I mean, I know for me, for the the Blues, David Backus plays his last game, um, Enterprise last night. And when Pujols returns to St. Louis, he always gets a round of applause. But not really a thing in soccer nowadays. So, but no, I, I think for what, what Matt Beasley's done for his team, his years of service, both as captain and non-captain, the trophies won. Um, I think, you know, he should, and I'm sure he will be welcomed back with, with open arms. Uh, so that, that'll be great to see. And then, of course, you have Josh Wolf as well. Um, head coach, his first head coaching gig, actually. And it, it's funny, I, uh, as the sports and KC beat writer, I unfortunately never got to actually watch, watch Josh Wolf when he was in Kansas City. Because, you, know, you know, he moved on in 2010. I moved here in 2011. I remember when I first uh, when I first found out I was moving here, which only was a bit, probably late 09, 2010. It's because of the FIFA campaign with sports in KC at the time, the Wizards. 
And I always say I was so disappointed. I was excited to be a Wizards fan. And uh, they changed the game my first year here. I was so disappointed. Uh, but I remember playing with Josh Wolf back then. And even in those days, FIFA and MLS probably wasn't as highly weighted as he was a baller. So it'll be good to have those two guys back here at Children's Mercy Park. And, you know, both guys deserve a, a standing ovation. And I'm sure they'll get one. Yeah, and they're not the only two. Davey Arno also uh, course, coaching yeah. staff, the assistant coach. Yeah. So quite a uh, quite a return, you know, back to, you know, for, for all three of them, a very memorable and accomplished place for, for all three in their careers here. So um, it's going to be definitely the weirdest, I think, for Matt Beasler, without a doubt, just given how recent uh, his departure was. And, and Beasler is definitely, I know, Sean, you're talking about how, you know, it's not really common for, you know, MLS teams and fans to do like standing ovations. But Matt Beasler is most definitely an outlier uh, in that trend, because I think anytime he comes to Children's Mercy Park, for the rest of his career, he'll get a standing ovation. There's no doubt. I don't know how long he'll be playing, but um, definitely looking forward to seeing him. And hey, he's been a, a key part of a, of a defensive back line that's been pretty solid in MLS so far. And, you know, mm-hmm. again, they're just yeah. a few games into the season, but they're looking good. And and yeah, he's he's not, you know, he wasn't playing much with Sporting Kansas City in his last season with the team, but he's been a huge part of this Austin FC team. Yeah, no, smart decision. Uh, I don't want to keep us going for too long, but, you know, again, Austin, you know, gave one, two, lost one. And the one they lost, it was their inaugural game at LAFC. I mean, not not many teams go to LAFC and win anyway. And it's also worth mentioning that the last uh, last expansion team to win an uh, inaugural game on the road was LAFC at Seattle. So that might have been a little bit of a, a foreshadowing to what they've become. But now, I mean, since then, you know, good wing against Colorado and Minnesota's been weirdly struggling, but still Austin beat them 1-0. And like you said, Ali, it's a pretty solid back line. It was great for Mac to go back there, or go down there, I should say. And just because, yeah, he he was kind of being phases out at Sporting KC, but a chance to be a veteran on an expansion team. Uh, that's probably the most valuable commodity, to be honest, for an expansion team, have those MLS veterans. So... Yes, Blair, you were saying it's a shame he went to a Western Conference team, but for him, he probably couldn't have left sports in KC at a better time and went to a better club and position. You know, uh, I, I I think he is one of the top two or three athletes who went to a Kansas City high school uh, and then played for a Kansas City pro sports team. Um, of course, Blue Valley West was his high school. Like Frank mm-hmm. White's the other one, Lincoln Prep, and then a Hall of Fame career with the Royals. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it very, they're, they're, it's a very short list of accomplished pro athletes for Kansas City sports teams that played their high school sports in Kansas City. Sean, tell us about Caden Pierre. Caden Pierre, yes. Uh, outside back for uh, sports in KC, homegrown playing out there. The 12th Academy trained homegrown player on this team, which is just absolutely insane to me. Um, but yeah, no, for you know, I've I've unfortunately not been able to see too much of him on SKC2, but you know, he kind of came into the spot like this preseason for sports and he was getting minutes during a preseason games. Um and Vermees was talking pretty highly of him back then, and you know, now he's kind of got into got himself a homegrown first team contract. So, you know, he's he said he models himself off Danny Alves, uh, former former Barcelona outside back in uh, peak years. Um, you know, he he prides himself on his one v one defense and he's an agile, speedy guy. How much playing time he'll get for Sporting? I mean, you know, may, maybe seeing how Graham Zusi recovers, he could get some back up minutes. It depends what how Zusi recovers because then you've got Luis Mars and Zamazu Deer on the left. Um, and then, of course, Zussi and uh, Jalen Lindsay on the right. So we'll we'll see. But again, Peter was talking about it yesterday too. These guys get homegrown, homegrown contracts. It doesn't mean you know, jump into the first team and start playing a bunch of minutes. It's it's got a chance for, to prove himself. You know, keep playing for SKC two, uh, keep up those high high level performances and great go into the first team over time. Yeah, well, and it's a good add too, Sean. Like you mentioned with. Zusi coming back from injury, Amadou Dia had uh, been out, you know, as well. 
mm-hmm. looking pretty thin there. You know, what happens? And he, uh, you know, Pierre's a player that's versatile. He can play on the left. He can play on the right. He's speedy, yep. uh, good, you know, in the attack, his recovery ability. And like that, like you mentioned that one-on-one defending ability. So a, a player with a lot of upside and, and someone who, because of the current status of, you know, the injury situation on the roster uh, with that position in particular, he could potentially find himself getting some uh, backup minutes, but looks like Graham Zussi's uh, been recovering and we'll hear more from Peter Vermees on Friday, but uh, uh-huh. potential that he's, uh, that he's back and ready to go. Mm-hmm. So we talk about um, motivation for people like Matt Bees or Josh Wolf and Davey Arnaud. Um, there's a little thing called wiping the bad taste from the mouths for Sporting KC this week after their last result. Um, coming off a three to one loss at at Salt Lake, that was um, got off to a good start, but mm. man, uh, to to lose that one. What? How about just yeah. a quick synopsis? What happened that night? Yeah, you know it's. I, I, you can't really hold over sports since had I mean, yes, they did not play very well after that first half hour. Uh, but, you know, obviously, the sports and KC Salt Lake rivalry has been a thing for a long time now. But even aside from that rivalry, Salt Lake is always a difficult place to go. One, just because of the fan base and, of course, the also choose. And then when you do that in the third week of the season, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough ask for anyone. And I think, you know, sports and stars are strong in the first 30 minutes. They were kind of running Salt Lake off the pitch and, um, you know, grab the goal. And then just, I think, uh, early season fatigue plus he also drew kind of took over, to be honest. And yeah, um, if you want a really quick tactical synopsis, I guess, you know, uh, sports and weren't really. Paying off attention to a couple of uh, good midfield players for Salt Lake and it kind of makes sports and pay through through balls to guys like Krylich and um, I'm forgetting a goal scorer now. Who scored two of their goals, Ali? Um, Ruby over Bean. Yeah, Ruby over Bean. Uh, you know, he was caught, he was wide open on the back post for their third goal as well. So not great marking, uh, not great closing down the midfield players, but I think you can just kind of chalk that up to early season fatigue in a very tough environment. And also, too, I mean, it was their earliest game that they've played so far, too. So, you know, there's different preparation, Mm -hmm. I think, when you play at 7 p.m. or 7.30 p.m. versus playing an afternoon 1 p.m. game. And then you couple that with the... Uh, the altitude, the travel, you know, I think some of those things played in for sure to the to the fatigue that we saw in that second half. But, you know, even still just some uh, some things to improve upon for Sporting Kansas City moving forward. And, and I think the midfield play uh, is is definitely one of those things. But, you know, they're also seeing players that are working back from injury. We saw Johnny Russell. We saw Alan Polito playing more minutes. But Team still without Isimat Marin, uh, who, you know, we've seen be really solid for them defensively across that back line in, in the center back role. So uh, curious to see what the starting lineup looks like, because as players become available, who's going to, you know, work their way back into the starting lineup as a starter, as a sub. So it'll be interesting to see. Before we finish, can, uh, can we just rename the show the August podcast, the John Luca Buzio podcast, because I'm going to yeah. talk about it again. Um <laughs> I think we do every week, but I think he does because they have special mention for his invisible assist, I guess you can call it, for sports. And yes. A uh, great run. Uh, I, I tweeted it out, a less intelligent player. I can go Shelton plays that ball across and someone who's a little bit more greasy, a little bit less intelligent. You know, the ball was a little bit behind Buzio, but he still could have got a good touch on it, tried to take it into his stride and try and squeeze through two soft lake defenders, but 18 years old and the kid knows that. I've got Alan Polito, designated player, behind me on my left and just let the ball go. And e- easy opportunity, easy goal for Polito. So, Buzio doesn't get the assist on that, unfortunately, but the goal doesn't happen without him. So, shout out, Buz. Mature beyond his years, for sure. Um, mm-hmm. All right. Enjoy our conversations. We go for 30 minutes a week. Ali, you go for two hours on Saturday. Tell us when and uh, and where they can find you. Well, this weekend, I will sadly not have a show. I am uh, having a little Mother's Day celebration, Aww. so I'm I'm off this Saturday. But I actually have 
something uh, exciting in the works for that weekend show. So stay tuned for more on that. But um, you guys know I love soccer. It's soccer season. So if that maybe tips you off to anything. Um, but yeah, you can catch me other than that, just mostly on, on game days, tweeting about the games on post-game shows, pre-game shows. Um, so looking forward to being able to share more as we get closer to the regular season for KC and WSL and more into the Sporting Kansas City season. Mm-hmm. Of course, Sean Goodwin is a mad tweeter as well during games and throughout the week. Yeah. And you can find his stuff also in the print editions of the Kansas City Star and on Kansas City dot com sean and kelly thanks you guys we'll talk to you again next week sounds good thanks you guys that'll do it for today and this week on sportsbeat kc thanks to our production staff of Derek donovan beth welsh monty davis jeff rosen chris fickett and savannah smith big thanks to ali trost and sean goodwin for stopping by and talking soccer links to sean's stories can be found in the show notes and on kansascity.com Hey, we've got another deal for you. You can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. Sports Pass is the online version of the Star Sports section. You get all the stories that appear in the print editions of the Star, plus many more stories that appear only on the website, and they certainly appear first on the website. After three months, this deal it auto renews at $5.99 a month, unless you cancel. It's always a great time to subscribe. The Royals... Still over 500, although what a terrible week with the with the Indian series and at Kaufman this week. Local college is always making news. It's never not chief season, and soccer now is in full swing. So how do you get this deal? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That's kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. You want more than just sports coverage? Check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports, news, features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional national news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. If you're having trouble hunting down any of the offers, you send me an email, bkirkoff at kcstar.com, and I'll get you to the right place. So, Whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting in supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports Beat KC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Monday with another episode.